General Wesley Clark is the former Supreme Allied Commander of NATO forces in Europe. He serves as Chairman and CEO of Wesley K. Clark & Associates, a strategic consulting firm, and is co-chairman of Growth Energy. He was the keynote speaker for an NCSL Legislative Summit session on energy and security in the 21st century. Thank you for joining us, General Clark. You told the session on energy security that energy is the saving strategy for the United States. What did you mean by that? I think energy is what is going to give us a chance to really jumpstart the economy again. You know, people are complaining that really since 2000, and especially since 2009, we're just not creating jobs, and the jobs we create are not the right kind of jobs. And so people lost these great manufacturing jobs at $25, $28 an hour, and they're getting service sector jobs and at $12 and $15 an hour when the jobs come back. And so I think if you look across America, uh, people are struggling. In, in my state of Arkansas, the median family income has actually declined in real terms, as it has across America over the last uh, 20 years. It's declined in real terms. That's not right, and it doesn't have to be that way. We can restart America's economic growth if we'll focus on the extraction of liquid hydrocarbons and biofuels, become energy independent, and then use those resources in the United States to deal with all our other problems, infrastructure and education and manufacturing and, and, and space, and, and rebuild our economy and take it forward. What are the critical issues the U.S. faces today in terms of energy and energy, energy security? Well, I think it's about both supply and price. So uh, we have the supply, but we're still importing. We're spending, uh, this year we'll spend a little over $200 billion net imports on, of petroleum. Now we're exporting 4 million barrels a day of product too, but we're still importing more than we're exporting. So that $200 billion is like a tax on the American economy. It comes out to be, $800 for every man, woman, and child in the country. And if a foreign country came here and demanded that Americans pay up, we want to go to war. Instead, they, we go to the pump and we pay up and we export that money from America that we desperately need at home. So I think it, it, a lot of it has to do with becoming energy independent in terms of supply of liquid fuels. Sure, if everybody drove automobiles and all, all, all electricity came from renewable, we wouldn't have this problem. But we don't have electric automobiles for everybody. We've got 250 million liquid fuel cars and vans and light trucks on the road that use gasoline. So we can't um, wish this problem away. We've got to deal with it. And it's a here and now problem. Every year we delay moving toward real energy independence is a year we're sacrificing 200 to 300 billion dollars abroad. Now, people in the fracking business say, don't worry, fracking's gonna take care of it. People in natural gas say, don't worry, we'll all use that. Everybody has their own answer to it. And one of the challenges we face in the energy sector and liquid fuels is that everybody competes with everybody else. You know, if gasoline doesn't like diesel, and gas and diesel don't like natural gas, and gas, diesel, and natural gas, they don't like biofuels, and I mean, Really, the whole world is hungry for American resources. Gas, diesel, biofuels, all of it can be exported to an energy-starving world. And what we have to do is put that together. So supply, number one. Number two is price. If we can put enough supply out there, we'll control the price, not Saudi Arabia. Now, $100 a barrel for oil, that's a pretty good price. At that price, we can produce all the liquid hydrocarbons we need in America. We don't need the price to be 120 or 140. Saudi Arabia and Russia would like it to be that high. So if we become the dominant energy exporter in the world and we control the margins there, we can control the price. And at price, at that price, uh, we, can, we can keep it around $100, $100 a barrel. We'll do just fine, production and exports. If we let that price go to $120 a barrel and we're not uh, energy independent, we're going to find even more of our national treasure drawn abroad. And all that money that, that's there abroad, those petrodollars, some of it leaks out to support arms, instability, insurgencies, and terrorism around the world. We don't want that. So 
energy security is about more than just energy independence. It's about controlling the price, keeping those resources here at home. You are not new to this to this issue and this discussion. You started writing about energy policy and energy issues in 1973. I did. How were they? Re, uh, how was? Um, how were, how were they received then, and where do you see where we are now compared to where we were then, which was a difficult time um, for domestic oil production? Well, in 1973, um, the oil market just sort of it just sort of happened. All of a sudden, prices began to go up in the United States. I remember you you go you drive five miles to go from 29 cents a gallon to 27.9 cents a gallon for ga for gallon of gasoline, and then. Suddenly, that was 1971, 72, and then suddenly the prices exploded because OPEC, an organization that we had basically acquiesced to, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, we allowed them to dominate these world oil markets, and as we became energy importing or oil importing, then we could no longer manage those prices, and they raised the prices on us. I went down to the Pentagon as a captain in 1973 to to write about the problem. I was one of the first writing about it. We recognized it was a strategic problem, not so much for the Department of Defense. Yes, it raised the cost in the defense budget, but, but for the defense budget, although energy is expensive, it's not the dominating factor. And although DOD uses a lot of liquid fuels, like 4% of US consumption, it's not the major consumer in the United States. So uh, the real issue was strategic. It was how would the United States respond, given the fact that oil is an integrated world market and that instabilities in the Middle East, which even in the 1970s looked like they were going to happen regularly, uh, would raise the, the price of oil and discombobulate the world economy and the American economy. In fact, if you go back and look at it, every major recession since the 1970s was preceded by a rise in the price of oil. So it's been a steady ratcheting up of the price of oil and gouging dollars from the rest of the world and impoverishing hundreds of millions of people in developing countries who didn't have oil around the world. That's what our lack of energy security has caused for the rest of the world. So uh, when I wrote about this, I suggested that in the 19, early 1970s that we might someday have to station troops in the Middle East. Um, in the Persian Gulf. And this was when we were drawing down in Vietnam, and people said, the nation's war weary. Captain, you can't talk about stuff like this. You're going to get called up in front of a Senate committee, and you're going to think the military is trying to take over the world or something. And no, they didn't like to hear it. Uh, but who could imagine that 41 years later, the toll that our energy dependence has taken on America's economy, on our on our well-being, on our national strategy, and on the young people in this country. What, um, what would you like to see state lawmakers be thinking about when they are shaping energy policy in their states? Well, I'd like to see them, uh, first of all, I'd like to see them expediting the permitting process so that we can produce more hydrocarbons. I'd like to see them tightening up the environmental re restraints so we do it more responsibly. And I'd like to see them advocating for Washington a complete package, more hydrocarbons, greater environmental protection, including a carbon tax. Start that carbon tax small. Maybe 20 years from now, it'll be enough to, you, you might raise it, but we need, to, we need to plant the flag so that America has a future that we can move to that's a less carbon intensive form of energy. And in the meantime, we need to increase our national power and our national economy by maximizing the production of hydrocarbons. You spent most of your working life in the military. What's the military's role in reducing energy risk, climate risk, all of that? Well, we're the power of the federal government. We're the largest energy consumer in the federal government. So whether it's electricity and how we generate electricity or the consumption of, of liquid fuels, we take a leading role. So we can push for, let's say, renewable energy. We can put solar and wind on military installations, and we can push to have biofuels as a backup. The Air Force and Navy have done that for jet engines and for ships, and the Army's done it for its locations, putting solar power on 
various military bases. And so as we put our demand in the marketplace, we, we're the path breakers. We set the standards, we uh, buy in, in volume, we try to drive the price down, we give young companies a chance to, to try it out on the military first before they have to compete in a broader commercial market. You talked about how World War II mobilized the country and the things. Are you concerned that there is not um, there is not a great um, national mobility around energy independence and things? And what do you think it would take to jumpstart that? Well, I think it, it's just sort of drifting out there. You know, Warren Buffett always says he'd rather invest in a company that's got the wind in its sails than pick the most educated management team in in another sector. And if you're looking at energy in America, the wind's in our sails. This is the way the economy wants to go. So all we have to do is let it go. We can open some doors, push it a little bit, and it'll go that way. We don't have to make a big ballyhoo about it. Everybody talks about moving toward energy independence. The question is, will we commit ourselves as a goal to becoming energy independent? That takes leadership, and that's what we need to commit at the state level and at the national level. Is there so much going on in the world and in the country that that's hard to focus, that it's hard to focus that on? I, you know, everything's always hard to focus on, especially in the current media environment. But uh, it's the job of leaders to bring that focus. Uh, a lot of people would rather figure out how short Kim Kardashian's skirt is or what Miley Cyrus has done on our last show or keep up with uh, the quarterback struggle for the Cleveland Browns. But the truth is that our national leaders have to help focus attention. I thought the president's done a pretty good job on the environment since he released that environment study back in, in uh, May that showed what the real risks are. Some business leaders have jumped on that. So we're getting the environment piece moving. We've got to get the energy piece moving the same way. You just mentioned leadership. How do you define leadership? What are the major characters of characteristics of a leader? I mean, you spent your well, career. I, you know, what I've always found is he used to say, a, a good leader always has a plan. He's trying to get something done. It's not just a matter of style. It's not a matter of being the most popular kid in the class. It's about, it's about uh, performance. Leadership is performance oriented. It's about accomplishing things. So uh, then it varies. If you want to accomplish things in business, sometimes it's different than, let's say, in law. And law might be different than in the ministry and the ministry might be different than in the military. So it is, it's characteristic, it has characteristics of its own separate milieu. But what's common to leadership is the ability to plan ahead and the ability to, to mobilize people and inspire them to get the job done. Eisenhower gave us a definition when he came back from World War II that all cadets had to memorize. And um, it's always been my definition of what leadership is. He said, leadership is, it's the ability to get the other fellow to want to do what you want him to do. That's leadership. You mentioned several of the hot spots in the world today when you're in your, in your address, and the world definitely seems to be in a perilous state, at least looking from the outside. But you also said there will always be crises in Washington. How, how do these things that are going on, especially Iraq, um, the Ukraine today, do they have an effect on our um, long-term energy independence to any degree? Well, th they have an effect on our long-term well-being. But what we have to do is we have to develop our energy independence so we have the resources and the sustainability and staying power as a nation so we can work our way through these crises. What's really important is the long-term challenges, not the crises, but the long-term challenges to the country. And those challenges are things like terrorism, cybersecurity, financial system stability, bringing China into the international system the right way, and dealing with the climate change that's uh, impacting us. So with these, all these five challenges, they're all, they all have the same kind of things in common. They, none of them can be dealt with inside the United States borders. They all involve other countries. They can't be dealt with by turning it over to the private sector. You've got to work government and the private sector together. They can't be, there's no magic in technology that's going to solve it. There's no investment in aircraft carriers. There's no single dimensional solution. And they are larger problems and they will extend longer than any person's time in office. 
So you could declare a war against cybersecurity or whatever you want to label it, but no president in his time in office is going to be able to totally erase this as a challenge. So these are the challenges that we need to pull America together to face. If we face these challenges, then dealing with the crises is natural and normal and easy. You mentioned all these challenges. How confident are you that, um, that we can get through this? Well, you've got to believe in this country. I mean, if we can't do it, who's going to do it? Thank you.